a roommate mentioned of the, of the poll that was released, and, and many of the people in the room are, are on the PACE mailing list, so you will have received the, received the results or seen the results. Uh, but Ben and Jeff are the two uh, pollsters, one Republican and one Democrat, and I'll leave, leave you to decide which, which one is which, uh, who, who, who do our polls for us. And, and so um, I'd ask them to come along and uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of, the, some of the key findings from the poll, and then we'll say a few more questions at the end. And uh, for those of you who came to see Morgan Polakoff, who is a rising star in education policy, uh, Morgan caught the flu and couldn't come. So those of you in the Morgan Polakoff fan, fan club can meet now. I'm going to do my best to take his play. Um, so, so uh, Jeff, I'll start with you. Um, the most surprising finding from the poll was, I think, the one that Arun alluded to, which is that public support for standardized testing in California is, is really strong. And that finding contrasts, to some extent, but possibly contrasts with another finding, which is that people trust teachers more than anyone else in the education system and believe decisions should be made at the local level. So how did you, how did you put those two findings together? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, when you, when you look at this poll, you, you look at the way that they're answering on different questions. And, you know, for someone like me, I also draw on uh, a lot of the experience I have going up and down the state with voters and various focus groups and qualitative discussions about their experiences and their perceptions. And what I think you see here is whether they realize it or not, voters are instinctively developing a system of checks and balances um, when it comes to the education policy. You see um, you know, very strong support for teachers. They like teachers. Um, they, I, they really, what we see, we have discussions. They idealize teachers. Um, the Edward James Olmos image, uh, all those successful teachers that have occurred in their lives. They, they believe in the power and the connection between a good teacher and a happy student, and they really don't want to mess with that. So when they want to set educational policy um, and they want to set accountability standards, I think most of them believe the fundamental piece should occur between the student and the teacher. That those two are the best equipped to uh, find the solution. But they also want some sort of oversight. And I think that's why you see the attraction to the uh, basic standardized testing. And standardized testing, in words itself, has some attachment to it. Um, it's been pushed around in the political arena as to teaching to the test, which the voters don't like that language. So they, you know, they have some perceptions based on it. But what they want is a piece of oversight that can be established, it's, it's in a standardized format that can be established uh, over and over again to give the sense that the teachers that are really living up to the, what they're expected to do and are performing appropriately. Yeah, yeah so I, I think uh, Jeff put it well. I mean, I think, um, I mean, just to step back a little bit and provide some context to doing uh, public opinion research among voters on education policy, and I think some of your uh, the panelists earlier today have talked about it. Uh, there is a huge gap between the discussion in this room and what goes out uh, in the world of, of, of voters, what they live, what they breathe. And the average voter, uh, first of all, only 25% of voters have kids in public school in, in terms of demographics, right? You only have 25% of the electorate who are young enough, have kids uh, between 6 and 18 attending public school. So think about that. Three out of every four voters has no interaction with the public school. They have no idea what's going on in the public schools. That's why you see such high response rates to, they have no idea about LCFF or core curriculum or, or, or whatever's going on, whatever new uh, you know reform is going on, unless it gets politicized. Like NLCB became a rattling cry, became, it became associated with Bush, became a very unpopular president, and Democrats and teacher unions use that as a foil to say, oh my God, this is an unpopular Republican president imposing their policies on our schools, and it became ick, and it became branded that way. Way, but the average policy, education reform policy, doesn't really make it through very far. But but you know you see kind of things on the margins. For example, why did Prop 30 pass? Well, what happened was years and years of budget cuts. The average voter was like, schools are getting cut. I'm seeing it. I'm feeling it. I either have kids in school. I have friends who are teachers, and I'm hearing about all these cuts, 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 cuts. Time, enough is enough. I'm okay with raising taxes for the most part on the wealthy, right? So it came to that point. Um, but it does matter because. For the kind of all the conversations you've had today about accountability, 
voters aren't demanding accountability. They're skeptical of government. You have the federal government shut down. I mean, we're talking today where the federal government is partially shut down. It could go on for another two weeks. Then you have a debt ceiling debate. And so there's cynicism and skepticism about how government operates. So that's kind of the desire for more local control because they don't trust Sacramento. They don't trust Washington. Although things in Sacramento have gotten better. Numbers of the state legislator numbers, the governor's numbers are better than they've been in, in a long, long time. Um, but with that said, so yeah, so you have to understand where voters are coming from. They don't have a deep un understanding of education policy, but there are certain things that they they have a sense that their schools have gotten worse. Or the polling shows that only twenty percent feel, uh, uh, should be thirteen percent feel schools have gotten better. Fifty percent feel schools have gotten worse over the last couple of years. And again, you think about dating back to Prop thirteen and the you know d d decline in funding that California's had and the deterioration in public schools in California. So they voters pick up on this kind of global broad broad sense of what's going on in the education world. And when when it comes to testing, um, yeah, there's, uh, you know, interesting, a lot of the work I've done, I've run campaigns with, with, with candidates where we've run against teaching to the test. We say no more teaching to the test. Um, and, and and there's a reaction to that. But in this poll, you know, as the Democratic part of the bipartisan team, I was surprised by how strong support there was for testing uh, at all levels, in terms of teacher valuation, in terms of holding students accountable, holding teachers accountable, holding schools accountable, evaluating, judging, uh, and we asked, and the thing about it, a researcher, right, is we try to ask different questions on different levels to kind of reinforce the finding, and, and what, what was impressive with these survey results was how consistent support was for testing. We asked it three or four different ways. Anytime we asked voters, more testing, less testing, they said more. Um, and all subjects, some subjects, let teachers do it, all subjects. So they're very consistent. And we also, so there's a class difference there. I mean, more blue collar, working class, non college educated voters are more likely to favor testing, uh, in part because they, you know, uh, more likely to live in lower performing school districts, but also because they, they like things black and white, like uh, testing can work. We can measure things, hold teachers accountable for it. So uh, in that regard, uh, but it does matter because if voters feel strongly about something or not, Prop 30, it passed. You need an extension if you want to keep this funding stream going, right? You're going to have to put it back to the voters in the ballot. If they don't feel that Prop 30 is having an impact or making a difference or feel that schools are getting better or at least won't get worse if you take the funding away, they may not approve an, an extension of it. So this has real implications to what all of you do. But again, from our perspective, a political perspective, uh, you know, it's kind of on the margins. But I think from, from coming out of the poll, like being able to try to explain to voters why testing matters, why holding teachers and students in, in schools accountable matters, uh, so that they have a sense of what's going on. And it starts kind of at the school level. You talk to the parents of school, they talk to their neighbors, and it kind of percolates out from there. But um, but the, the, the role of teachers, I mean, it's, it's um, you know, the interesting position of teachers here, we saw kind of a, a tough love approach to teachers in this poll, which was, they're absolutely instrumental, important voters view them in, in the role of education, but they want to, they're open to merit pay, although, you know, if you put that initiative on the ballot, teachers union would spend a lot of money and probably defeat it, but as a concept, voters are open to that idea. Um, they also say, look, um, you know, you got to hold teachers accountable. You have to allow testing to so that you are met, have some sort of metrics, as many of you talked about earlier, to, to know how they're doing. I mean, it's only fair to do that uh, because a lot of them get judged on their jobs in, in, in the private sector, uh, why teachers should be judged too because of how important their job is. And the other thing is, but if a teacher's struggling, they're, they, they, do want, want, they don't want to bring that hammer down on the teacher. They want to give them the chance. They want to give them the resources to get training and to help students because at the end of the day, if a teacher fails, everybody fails, right? So I think there is sympathy and support for it. Um, but there is a role, voters view, that there's a role for testing to, to see how the heck their students and the teachers are doing and the schools are doing. And that's one way to measure, uh, not the only measurement, but one way to do it. Uh, I, I would I would add it, it. I think for a lot of voters, what it's become is really like the JD Power Measurement Awards. Some of those things we see in consumer sales that you know we so we rely on to some extent. Um, they like that, and I think if they see threats to that going away, um, that you know you're not going to have testing. Uh, they, they they understand the need to not have too much testing, but if they get a set sense that, they're, that 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 some group or some effort is attempting to take away testing, they're going to see that as a threat to the transparency that they think they deserve, and they're not going to be pleased with that. You, you've actually answered my second question, so I'll go on to the third, which which relates, I think, to some comments that Ben made about you know, that, that most people don't live in our world. Arun made the same comment, that, that they're not well informed about a number of these issues that, that concern us on a daily basis. Uh, one question that we asked in the poll was, was actually, we asked 
ask voters to compare the three models of accountability that we've talked about today. The, the standard-based accountability model, the uh, local control accountability plans, and the core accountability waiver. And we gave them quite a lot of information about those three models. And the core model, the, the description of the core model, polled about twice as well as the other two. About 50% of people preferred the core, the description of the core model to the local control accountability plan or the standard space. And I think that the question, and maybe Ben, I'll, I'll address it to you first, is, is how seriously should we take that finding? This is a lot of information to present to voters, a lot of vocabulary that they're probably not familiar with. Is that is that a meaningful finding or is that just sort of their best guess as to what might work? Well, I think it's a, it's a helpful task. So we, we gave, uh, if you all saw the survey, we gave three choices and about four or five bullet points for each with a lot of information. And I should clarify, this was an online survey. so. Uh, but it's actually more, doing a question like this would not be possible on a phone survey because you can't read this much information to them. But with an online survey, they can read each one, hem and haw, chew on it, each one, and de decide which one they like the best. Um, and you know, actually, this is a good simulation of kind of what you all do every day to try to hash out education policy, implement education policy, which is complicated, complex, and goes beyond what the average voter is going to get. And then you give them. This information, and they make a re they give you an opinion on what they hear and see, and there are certain things that that they respond to more strongly than others. And I didn't know, quite frankly, when we drafted this question, I'm like, are they going to get any di the differences between the three? But they did. I mean, they really did. And the, as David said, half chose uh, choice three, which was. You know, I think there's some key words here. One is we say, the main responsibility for ensuring that schools and teachers are performing at satisfactory levels should remain with professional educators. The word educators for the average voter is a teacher, right? So you're saying you're basically, the previous questions we found, the data we found was people support teachers that are the most important factor in whether a school succeeds or fails. They have the biggest impact on the kids' lives. So when you say you're gonna basically rely on, you know, uh, more emphasis on it, professional educators supposed to state or local or national level, uh, they responded to that. Um, and you know, the, we also included, um, we say shared responsibility uh, with teachers, school leaders, and, and rewards and punish, you know, rather than rewards and punishments, uh, teachers, schools, and school districts should hold one another accountable. So there's kind of a shared accountability approach. And I think, again, we saw another findings in the poll that that resonated with well, the local control was was too local I think and wasn't big picture enough for the average voter uh, and then the other the choice one talked more about the legislature and the state board of education so you're going to lose some support there but uh, so I think it was telling it does reflect kind of uh, where voters their values are and how they view education and it's a good real world test of what you do in a policy level how that translates out to how voters respond to it um, and, it, and it gave us some interest. And the fact that we got a, a clear answer was surprising to me and it tells you something. And it's in line with, with the other results of the survey. And again, that's what we look for, consistency. Yeah, I, I, I would have to agree. Um, I, I thought that when, when you look at those questions, the three, the three scenarios that were posed to, um, to the likely voter, and I, I think most of the voters were gonna look at that and say, oh, that's a lot of, that's a lot of really big words and a lot of stuff to consider. Um, but there clearly was a choice that, that many of them coalesced around, and that speaks a lot. And I think when you look at those between those two choices, as Ben said, there's a, a big focus on that the, 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 the primary responsibility should remain with the professional educators. And that's, I think that's core versus the other two options, which talk about you know, putting the primary responsibility at the state level, or um, even the second option, which is putting the primary responsibility between the parents and the local school districts. Um, if you look at the pool poll, you do see that later it talks about who should be primarily responsible for accountability for schools that are schools and school districts that are failing, and they specifically focus on the school. They, they choose they choose the school district and the school board. Uh, so I think their their sense is the people that should be taking action occur at that level. But when they when they talk about setting policy and setting setting standards and setting the, the base level for what's going to go forward. They clearly have the choice here, and they want to focus on the student-teacher relationship. Just follow up with that, David. The reason why I think this is so important is, um, you know, you think about your average school board election. The voters who vote in those elections have only slightly more information than the voters in our survey, right? So they, if you think about who's setting education policy, well, ultimately voters do. They vote for the state superintendent of public instruction, which is you know, Torx is up for re-election next year, um, you know, and, and 
or school board where these campaigns typically have minimal resources behind them so voters are going to the voting booth and voting with very little information and they hear snippets and sound bites and not much more than that or endorsements they say who's supported by teachers who's supported by democratic party and whatnot um, and so again it's like whatever so if someone says i'm for accountability i'm for testing and someone says i'm not for it that could determine who gets elected and who doesn't to school board, which of course uh, ultimately can drive policy at the local level. So that's why it does kind of, the, the, the role of politics and education policy of course is very strong and like Prop 98 we talked about, here, uh, you know, things like that, Prop 30, I mean, so all these things do matter. And so what, what resonates with voters and what's effective, and if you do come up with policy that is very effective in the education world, then I think it's tantamount to try to get the word out to voters like, hey, we have a policy that's working, it's effective, and, and, and the, the challenge, I think, for all of you is how to make it simple. I mean, the, the beauty of NCLB, for its all faults and all, is it's, you know, the, the, the Bush administration was very good at coming up with good sounding policies, right? No child left behind, you know, clean forest initiative or whatever, which meant no tree uncut, but that's okay. Just the clean skies initiative, which meant more pollution. But, you know, if you could frame something that well, you know, I, I encourage all of you to come up with better sounding, like, I, I'm, no offense, but like a lot of the labels and language here, it's like, you know, LCFF, no one's gonna know what that is, you know? And if we come up with a, a better way to describe all the good policies you're developing, I think that could actually help the cause but anyway um, that that actually is accurate to what you do and not deceptive so and, and, and I would say it, it, in the poll um, typically we asked two we asked two questions we asked um, one about the uh, common core standards awareness and then and then gave a little bit since most people were unaware of it which we assumed would be the case we asked okay here's what here's kind of a he said she said about it here's one argument why we should have, do this and one argument why we should do not not do it um, and then we um, when, when, you, when you put that question to voters, you have very low awareness, but when you break that out, the people that were awareness, aware of it, they had much stronger support. And you can see that throughout the poll, the, vo the voters that are more educated about the specific pieces of policy that, 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 that's being put forth are much more supportive um, up and down the line of these specific policy procedures. Okay, I, I, I point you to, there's a pollster's memo that Jeff and Ben brought their copies of that yeah. available, right? So, so all of the, if you haven't seen the poll results, uh, those are available. And I, I would like to leave at least a couple minutes for questions. Most of the panel is still here. Jeff and Ben are both still here. And uh, if there are concluding questions or comments, uh, I'd like to hear them. Yes. Yeah, just use your teacher voice. out a whole new testing kind of program so I'm a little bit curious there will be you know full-on scores next year in 2015 um, so and there will be a, a way to talk about measures across districts we're not getting rid of that but we are rebuilding it and we are rethinking it based on this huge transformation that's coming so I, I think that they work nicely together I think that uh, there's some uncomfortableness about uh, this year um, where we'll be doing field testing but it is building back the system so um, I you know we'll have all of those things back in place Chris so I think this would sort of be for anybody um, it, one of the things that seems so interesting about the run-up to the accountability reform was a notion of continuous improvement built into some of the draft bills. And I'm 
I wonder, I, I was really struck by the stair step uh, from minimal accountability to proficiency to college and career readiness. And I wonder if we're going to enter a phase of sort of figuring this out in the next 18 months, two years, and then locking in for 15 or 20 years uh, with a single system. And, I, and I'm wondering what the state, as it looks at accountability, can do to foster uh, increased understanding by uh, the community about what's going on, increased understanding among the professionals about what to do about things, and increased capacity for all levels of government to continuously improve. Because I think when we look at systems that are producing high results for kids, actual kids, in terms of graduation and college readiness and college going and college persistence, they don't do anything like valuing state summative tests or any kind of summative test as 60% of the discussion. Um, so how, how would we get into a continuous improvement cycle around driving down the 60% measure and driving up the other measures that are more related to learning? And how would we um, not have to have incredible alignment between uh, a governor, a uh, state board, uh, you know, uh, Torlakson, you know, superintendent, which we have this sort of amazing group of people who are all aligned right now, but how would we future-proof ourselves around continuous improvement? Sue, can I ask you to, to address that? Sure. In the context of local control, because I think the LCAP is actually addressing that. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly the idea, and, and I think Merrill talked earlier about this notion of what piece is standardized which, and then allow for customization. Um, and that's definitely the idea around the LCAP, that the eight state priority areas are identified um, including, I, I want to answer Amy's question a little bit too, that the new test scores when they're available will be rolled into the academic performance index and that's still going to be part of what, what we all look at. But I, I agree with you, I really appreciate your point and I think Rick and I have been around probably the longest. Um, you know, our hope when we put the academic performance index in place was that it would be we would be evaluated after a couple of years and say, is that right? Is that the right mix? What should we add? At, at, at the beginning, we were going to have teacher attendance rates, student attendance rates, and you know we were never able to make that happen. So I think certainly the legislature has an interest, as does any governor who comes in. Certainly, I hope this one will be here for a while. Um, to say we need to keep looking at this and saying, is it working correctly, and, and make periodic adjustments. But having said that, I will. I just want to harken back to what Deb said earlier. It took us at least a decade to implement new standards, new materials, new prof you know, professional development. So things move slowly in the state. This is a massive enterprise. So, and Rick's comment about this is a process, not an event. I think we have to have some level of patience to say, give it five, give it 10 years before you really do step back and say, are there fundament fundamental things that are not working that need to be changed? Because the LEAs, they need time to make this work and to make sure that they put all these processes in place. We can't expect them to turn on a dime because we you know, flipped a switch on a new piece of legislation. Any final questions? Otherwise, I'd like to thank all of our speakers, presenters, panelists, holsters. Um, you know, they do this as a favor to Pace and as a favor to you, and we're grateful to them always for their, for their help and for their insight. And we thank you for coming, and uh, go forth and implement the Common Core. <laughs>